So um, in doing some of the research um, for, for this uh, seminar, um, I did look at other states' approach to, to spousal maintenance. Um, in, in Santa Ana uh, Clara, uh, California, um, during the uh, course of the proceeding only, they do have this kind of um, guideline that they'll use in terms of this, a formula to be able to determine what the maintenance would be. Uh, I'm not going to do any math here, and I'm not, not expecting any of you to either, but you can see here that, that they will take the payor's net income, and they define that by being the payor's gross monthly income minus income tax and Social Security payments minus the child support. Then they subtract that from the child support times 40%, and then they subtract that from the payee's net income times 50%, and, and they'll determine what the maintenance is on that. That, if it's during the course of the proceeding itself, uh, can be somewhat of a guideline, at least for the amount of maintenance that potentially would be paid post-decree. Uh, Ohio has um, you know, no specific guideline per se like uh, Santa Ana, Clara, uh, California does. Um, they will frequently though use a three to one ratio for the duration of um, spousal maintenance and, and lifetime maintenance is possible in a longer term marriage. Of course, the court has jurisdiction to be able to, uh, to modify the maintenance uh, provision. Uh, so it takes a little bit different approach in terms of uh, the, the maintenance that they would, uh, that, that they would allow. Um, they require a 10 year marriage for any post divorce maintenance, except in cases of, of disability. And, um, you know, there were probably more disability claims, I would gather, in Texas as a result of that statute. Um, and, and support is limited then to $2,500 per month for a period not to exceed three years. Now, I don't in any way, you know, support a statute that, that, that is, you know, restrictive like that. I think that that's pretty restrictive, my, my personal view is. Um, but at the same time, you know, as a family law practitioner, it's certainty in some way. I mean, when you go into a mediation, and this is what the law is, then you know what you can advise your client. And that's something that you can definitely rely on um, when making a determination as to what it is. Um, I'm just curious to know um, how many people in the seminar would, would be in support of some type of a specific formula like we have for child support for spousal maintenance. Just a show of hands, how many people would support that? And how many people would not support that type of a, uh, okay. and how many people are just indifferent? Okay. Does anybody who supports having a guideline or a statute in place that would define you know, how much maintenance would be, want to offer the reasoning and analysis behind it. Okay. Well, I could gather that probably it's because it does give you certainty, and that's something that certainly as a family law practitioner is helpful to us to be able to advise our clients instead of it being just totally and completely discretionary. Um, I'm going to kind of jet through some of these because I'm running out of time for this segment, but I did want to comment on the American Academy of Matrimonials. Um, they did come out with recommendations regarding a specific uh, duration and amount of spousal maintenance, and uh, these were provided in 2008. To determine the duration of maintenance, what they do is they take the, mul they, uh, multiply the length of the marriage by um, the following factors. So if it's zero to three years, they multiply the length of the marriage by 0.3, three to 10 is 0.5, 10 to 20 years is 0.75, and over 20 years, um, there's, there could be permanent maintenance. And of course, the court still would have discretion if there were specific you know, criteria um, in the statute, but um, this is one way to be able to determine uh, the, the duration. Yeah. When they say permanent, I mean, does that mean the payor never retires? He always has to produce a source of income until the day they get in the box? <laughs> I would assume that it's probably, um, you know, permanent until there would be some kind of a substantial change of circumstance, then you could come back to the court to be able to make a request. Like retirement would be one of the things, of course, that if your income changes because of the fact that you've retired, that you'd have the ability to change that. And modify, or, and, and modify it, right. And then to determine the amount of alimony, um, you know, they, they provide another formula in terms of that. Uh, they take 30% of the payor's gross income minus 20% of the payee's gross income, but when added to the gross income of the payee, the alimony shall not result in the recipient receiving in excess of 40% of the combined gross income of the parties. Um, I wanted to comment on a, on a, on a case um, in Maryland, uh, marriage of Bomeo, in which the wife was awarded $3,000 per month um, uh, you know, lifetime maintenance. And there was, there's a statute in Maryland that has factors similar to Washington uh, in terms of the discretion that the court has. Um, the wife's attorney argued the AML recommendations to the court. The court um, did consider those recommendations along with the um, statutory factors. And on appeal, um, it was upheld by the Court of Appeals to say certainly the court you know, can consider other things, including the AAML recommendations. It, the, the statute that they had was a, a non-exclusive statute. 
And so that might be something you would consider if you're going to be arguing cases, um, you know, in Washington State as well.